good morning and welcome to the Learn and Grow program for April 17th, 2021. This is the Williamsburg Botanical Gardens uh, educational component. My name is Judith Alberts. I serve on the board of directors at the garden. Housekeeping for today. Yes, we are recording and we'll be posting this on YouTube. Please check that you are muted. We recommend turning off your video camera for privacy and close other applications and devices that are using bandwidth. We'll be using the chat box for questions at the end. And something that we're doing, this is new for all of us on today's program, is uh, that we're going to try polling. So I've taken a screenshot. There will be a poll that will pop up and then you would select your answer and click submit. And then we will share the results. And uh, now what we discovered during the test run through is that it may or may not close for you. So if necessary, you can close the shared poll. Uh, mm -hmm. Bear with us because we're new to this. For anyone joining us who has never been to the Botanical Garden, I will run through a very quick uh, introduction. We are free to visit, open every day of the year from 7 a.m. till dusk. Canines are always welcome to bring their well-behaved humans on a leash. The garden is really quite small. It is located within Freedom Park and you enter the park. If you can see my cursor, the entrance is about three quarters of a mile from here. You actually travel around one side of the garden, come along here, park over here. The Interpretive Center of Freedom Park is where we used to hold these sessions in person before COVID-19. So park your car, walk do 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 along this one little path, and then take a right hand turn. And this is the decorative main entrance to the garden. It's only two and a half acres, but we pack a lot into it. Um, a wildflower meadow that is intentionally left with standing stems in the winter time to help uh, protect and. Um, <clears throat> pro pro provide habitat for wildlife. And if I can just ask someone to please check your speaker because I'm hearing a throat clearing. Um, so back to back to the introduction here. We are a wild child garden in in that we don't have highly maintained or highly manicured displays, um, but we have 18 different types of habitat, including a newly installed carnivorous plant display. Uh, we're pretty excited about that and we're working on signage so everyone will understand what we have. Now everything in the garden is planted and maintained by volunteers on a, and we do it on a very slim budget, but it still takes about $20,000 just to keep the garden open every year. And that does not include major maintenance projects that are coming up. So we do ask your support. WilliamsburgBotanicalGarden.org. The link to the recording will, or excuse me, the email with the link to the recording will include a link to our handy dandy virtual donations jar. We encourage you to support the garden through membership. If you shop Brent and Becky's uh, bulbs in, in Gloucester start at bloomandbucks.com and they donate 25% of your order to the nonprofit of your choice. Hope, we hope you'll choose the garden. And if you shop Amazon, please start at smile.amazon.com. And when I started monitoring our dashboard uh, about nine months ago, we had five supporters and it we didn't even make the $5 minimum donation mark that Amazon puts on when they will disperse funds. But we now have 24 supporters and it's really great. Um, back in February, we received just under $25. So things are growing, every penny counts. The garden is on Facebook 
if you raise monarchs, please join us on the milkweed connection. This is where the today's recording will be posted, our YouTube channel. And this is a screenshot of our Instagram account, which we're just beginning to get our feet wet on working with that. Here's what's coming up in the garden. Next Saturday, April 24th, we will have an in-person Earth Day slash Arbor Day tree planting ceremony um, in the garden. It will be quite nice. We are collaborating with the James City County Environmental Sustainability Department and Master Gardeners. The same day, our Plants with a Purpose Honor Box sale opens. So we've been getting a lot of inquiries. When does the sale start? And it's coming up. It'll open up next week. May 15th's program for Learn and Grow will be volcano mulching and other tree crimes. And then in June, we'll be talking about the sound of cicadas. Master gardeners and master naturalists may count this as continuing education. Today's program is the snake in the grass and other garden guests. And our speaker is Megan Thomas, who is a watchable wildlife biologist and a certified wildlife biologist. She received her Bachelor of Science in Ecology and in Animal Behavior, so a, a double degree, from Towson University in North Carolina. Oh, I'm sorry. I jumped ahead in my notes from Towson University. She received her master's in biology from Eastern Illinois University. And this is very, her, her thesis was on snake dietary ecology. Now talk about specific. Prior to coming to Williamsburg, she was at Davidson College in North Carolina and was the research manager for the herpetology lab. Her favorite reptiles, um, include, and amphibians, include the Eastern Diamond Rattlesnake and the Diamondback Terrapin. So here is the website for the um, Department of Wildlife Resources. This is where she works. And her job is to educate and engage the public over uh, about the diverse wildlife here in Virginia. She serves on the executive board of the Virginia Herpetological Society and is co-advisor to the histo historic rivers chapter of the Virginia Master Naturalists. So welcome and thank you very much, Megan. We are just very excited to have you here. So I'm gonna stop my share and you have the camera and the mic. Okay, let me pull up my share screen now so we can get this presentation started. Okay, let's, oops, sorry. Okay, I think everybody should be seeing my screen now. <laughs> You're good to go. All right, let me just move this really quick. Okay, so thank you guys um, for coming to listen to me talk today about one of my favorite subjects, which is reptiles and amphibians, um, snakes, turtles, salamanders, frogs, all of those things that so many people don't like to think about, but I love to think about. Um, and thank you, Judith, for that very wonderful introduction. I hope that I can um, live up to everybody's ex uh, expectations today. Um, as Judith mentioned, I am a watchable wildlife biologist for the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources. So my job um, is my dream job. I, I get to engage folks every day with, with their native and local wildlife. Um, I wouldn't wanna be doing anything else. Um, and as Judith mentioned today, I'm gonna be talking about reptiles and amphibians, more specifically those that are native to Virginia and even more specifically than that, uh, the reptiles and amphibians that you guys are really, really likely to encounter in your backyards and gardens. Um, you know, as a, as a general rule, reptiles and amphibians, they're, they're incredibly secretive. Um, they, they don't acclimate to people the way that some other wildlife species do. Um, deer being a classic example, I, I think about the deer in my backyard that I 
can get probably within about five feet of because they're just so acclimated to, to people in these urban areas. Um, most reptiles and amphibians, you know, they're, they're not like that. They're really secretive. They don't want to be seen. Um, so for, for the vast majority of species, you really need to go out of your way to find them. Um, but there are a handful of them that, that are pretty common to see in backyards and, and around urban areas. And so those are the ones that I'm going to be really focused on uh, with my talk today. So this species that you see here on the, um, on the title slide, this is a, a smooth earth snake. And I, I, um, I have to show you this one too. When I was putting my slides together, I loved both of these pictures so much. I, I just couldn't pick between the two of them. Um, so this is also a smooth earth snake. Uh, this is my honorable, uh, my honorable mention title slide because like I said, both the pictures are just so great. <laughs> So um, today, just to give you guys a quick overview of what I'm going to be talking about, um, we're going to incorporate a handful of those poll questions that Judith was mentioning at the beginning of the presentation. Um, so just to get everybody used to that, I'm going to start out with a really small snake quiz, uh, where, which we'll use that poll feature for. So hopefully everybody will get the hang of how to operate that if you haven't done it through Zoom before. And then um, after that, we're going to go through a variety of the myths surrounding snakes. We will hit on some basics of wildlife ecology. We'll talk about the snakes of Virginia. We'll talk about our other herp guests. Um, and we'll also talk about attracting herps to the garden. Uh, and then I'll open the floor for questions. And just so you guys know, um, you've, you've probably heard me say this term already, herps, H-E-R-P. Uh, -E Herpetology is the study of reptiles and amphibians. Um, that's a really long thing to say in a presentation. So when I'm talking about just general reptiles and amphibians, I, I use that slang, herps. So that's what that term means. Okay, so let's get started with our very first poll and quiz question here. Um, so my question for you guys is how many venomous snakes do you see in this photo? These are all species that occur in Virginia. I want everybody to take a good look at them and figure out how many of them they think are venomous species. And what I'm gonna do is pull up the poll question. And um, hopefully you had enough time to look at your pictures there. If you're on a computer, you can use your mouse to move that poll window around to the side of your screen so you can also see the pictures. I'm seeing some results coming in already. We'll give it just a little bit more time. More results are coming in. We've got 23 out of 29 people have voted, 25 out of 29. I think that's wow, cool. we have we have an engaged crowd. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh, 27 out of 29, 93% have voted. And, and just a little side note, what we have discovered is that anyone who is a co-host is not able to vote. That's so. right. So 27 actually then with, with that in mind is probably our, nat, our max. So I'm going to end the polling and I'm going to share the results. So here's what everybody said. Uh, three people, 11% said zero, eight people, 30% said one, two people, that was the most popular answer, or, or sorry, uh, nine people with the most popular answer of two, a uh, handful of people said three, some said four, some said five, and one person said all are venomous. Uh, so now, um, let me stop sharing the results here. The answer to the question, Those of you that said one, there was one venomous snake on there. It was the cotton mouth. But as you guys hopefully saw from that, I, I, I hate to say it, but I tried to trick you a little bit. I included some photos that were intentionally tricky. This one, especially right here, if you can see my mouse circling, this one here is a, a black rat snake, um, but it, you can see it's flattened its head to have this very triangular shape. Same thing with this non-venomous water snake here. This one's got the colors of a copperhead. This is another water snake. So yeah, tricky pictures. All that is just to say that it's a lot more difficult than some people think to identify venomous snakes. Okay, so next poll question. True or false, some snakes in Virginia will actually give live birth instead of laying eggs. Let me pull up the poll and then you guys can tell me if you think that's a true statement or a false statement. Here we go. Let 
Oh, you guys are fast. 21 out of 29 already. 23, 25 of 29. 26 of 29. And there's 27. Okay, end the poll. Here's the results. Here's what everybody said. Most people said true, 19. That's 70% of the folks on the presentation. Eight of them said false. So what's the answer? It's true, which fortunately most of you guys got. So you guys know a lot more about snakes um, than, than some other individuals do. <laughs> um, okay, so yes, there, there are quite a few snakes, not just in Virginia, but um, all across the world that, that give live birth in, instead of actually laying eggs. All right, next one, which is the proper terminology to use when referring to snakes? And this is gonna make more sense once I pull up our poll here. Here we go. So what's the proper terminology to use when referring to snakes? Do you use venomous and non-venomous? Do you use poisonous and non-poisonous? Can you use either one or is neither one of those correct? Oh my gosh, you guys are so fast. We're already at 20 of 29. Twenty-six of twenty-nine. And we just had someone else join. So now we're at twenty-seven of thirty. All right, I'm gonna end the poll because we hit that uh, twenty-seven number and share the results. All right, here's what everybody said. Most people said that venomous and non-venomous is the proper terminology to use when referring to snakes. One person said poisonous, non-poisonous. Nine people said both A and B are correct. And luckily nobody said A or B is correct uh, or neither A or B is correct. Um, that one I can already tell you is definitely the wrong answer. So what's the answer to this question? The answer is actually both A and B are correct. And I this is another one that was a little bit tricky of a question because um, you know, most people think that that snakes, you know, that venomous is the proper terminology as opposed to poisonous. Venomous generally implies it bites you and and that's how you get the poison in your body or the venom in your body, whereas poisonous is you bite it and you get the poison in your body. <laughs> um, so um, there actually are a very select handful of snakes across the world that are poisonous and some that are even both venomous and poisonous. Now, for all of the snakes that we have in Virginia and, and in North America, venomous is really going to be the proper term uh, to use there. But like I said, there are a handful in Asia that, that are actually, we've discovered, are poisonous also. So that's just a fun fact. Okay, one more. True or false, venomous cottonmouths are more aggressive than the majority of other species and are prone to chasing off potential predators and or humans. Let me pull the poll up. What do we think? Twenty of thirty have voted. Twenty-three of thirty. Twenty-five of thirty. Maybe some people just don't know, so they're unsure. Twenty-eight of thirty. Okay, I think that's our max number now. I'm gonna end the poll. Share the results. All right, I am so happy to see this answer that the vast majority of people said false for this one. This is such a common myth um, that, that cottonmouths will chase you, that they're really aggressive, that they're the worst snake to encounter. Um, the reality of the situation is that um, venomous snakes in general are much less likely to bite uh, people than non-venomous snakes. And that's because venom was actually evolved as a way to help digest prey items. You know, it, it breaks down prey items inside. Um, it really wasn't evolved to be a, a, a really big anti-predatory strategy. Um, or defense mechanism. Now it certainly has potential as that, but but really it was all about prey. So if you're a venomous snake and you see a human, um, obviously that human is not a prey item. They're way too big to eat. Um, so they really don't wanna waste that venom that takes a, a, a lot of time to build up and accumulate in their bodies. They really try to only save it for potential prey items. Whereas the non-venomous species, um, they've really got nothing to lose. They don't have any venom to waste. So they're, they're much more prone to bite. 
Um, and there's actually scientific studies that have backed that up also. So if anybody has more questions about that, I, I'm happy to talk to you later in the presentation about it. Oh, I had one more. Oh my gosh, I have too many polls. Sorry guys. <laughs> True or false, juvenile venomous snakes are typically more dangerous than adults. Let's see, here we go. What do we think? We have 21 of 30 have responded, 25 of 31. We had somebody else join the presentation. True or false, juvenile venomous snakes are typically more dangerous than adults. We'll give it a couple more seconds because I know there's some folks who haven't voted yet. All right, we'll call it. Here's what everybody thought. 17 people thought true, eight people thought false. So what's the answer? It is false. This is another one of those really, really common myths. I hear it all the time. People think that the juvenile or the baby venomous snakes, um, they can't control their venom or, or the venom is more potent. There has never been any, there's never been any research that has backed that up. Um, and people have, have studied it too. Um, so the reality of the situation is, you know, a larger snake is gonna have a larger venom gland than a smaller snake. Um, so by that nature alone, you know, larger venomous snakes are, are typically gonna be packing more venom than smaller snakes, but no evidence to support this, this myth that snakes are, um, the smaller ones are, are more dangerous than the adults. And so that leads me into this next point, which I, <laughs> I, I read an article recently about how the vast majority of people actually know more snake myths than they do snake facts. So this is just an accumulation of some of the myths that I have heard throughout the course of my career. A lot of them involve identification. We'll talk about why these things are, are myths in a little bit. There's that saying, you know, red touches black, friend of Jack, red touches yellow, will kill a fellow. That's not really a reliable method either. Um, Killing snakes is the best way to protect yourself, children, people, and pets in the area. Stinging snakes with the tongue. Black snakes. This is a really common one in this area too. There's people will say black snake um, and, and think that it refers to a single species of snake when actually um, there is no snake with a common name in the U.S. of just black snake. In Virginia, we have several. There's rat snakes, there's black racers, and there's eastern king snakes. Um, so there's there's quite a few snakes that, that um, you know, get lumped under that black snake name. So anyways, this is, like I said, just a, a compilation of some of the myths that I hear all the time about snakes. And if you guys think of another thing that you know of a snake um, and you wanna know if it's true or false, type it into the chat. And at the end of the presentation, I'll let you know if it's a myth or a fact. Um, another one of the really common ones I hear is about distinguishing cotton mouths from other non-venomous species. You know, everybody says that the cotton mouths, they swim on top of the water surface or they float on top of the water surface, whereas the other species swim underneath the water surface. That's totally a myth. All snakes can swim both of those ways. It, it just depends on how much air they put in their lungs, which is what floats them on top of the water or, or brings them below. And another one I hear is that snakes can't open their mouths underwater. That's not true either. A, lo a lot of species eat fish, so they have to be able to open their, their mouths under the water. Um, so yeah, hopefully this, this uh, suite of images shows you guys <laughs> that some of that stuff isn't true. Okay, and so one of the most common questions that I get all the time about reptiles and amphibians is, why is this thing in my yard? Um, you know, they don't want it there. They don't understand why it's there. They live in a neighborhood. It, it's just not the right place for, um, for that particular animal. And that really comes down to kind of the basics of wildlife biology. So you've got four things that all animals need to survive. There, it's water, it's food, it's shelter, and it's space. That's the four things. And those things together collectively make up what we as wildlife biologists and call as a, a, a habitat, you know, that's, that's their habitat. It's your collection of water, food, shelter, and space. And so when we use terms like wildlife habitat, it's really, really idyllic images like this that, that sort of spring to our minds, right? You know, these beautiful scenic landscapes, no signs of people in sight, except for maybe there's a road in the background over here. But you know, there's wide open spaces, there's shelter in trees, there's water, there's clearly grass here that these elk are feeding on. This is what we think of as ideal wildlife habitat. 
And it's certainly not places like this. This is not what we think of when, if I was to ask you guys, you know, think of wildlife habitat. I don't think anybody out there is gonna be picturing a, a busy suburban neighborhood street. Um, now the problem here is that um, if we get back to those, those wildlife basics and the four things that wildlife need to survive, um, what if we were to replace our needs with needs like this, you know? So here we have those raccoons going from uh, natural water sources to bird feeders and food from trash cans, sheltering in barns and outbuildings and space, even using privacy fences like highway corridors across people's lawns. That happens all the time. Um, once you start to realize that animals can very easily get their needs from some of these urban areas, it makes a little bit more sense why they are in our backyards. Um, and of course, this is going to vary species to species. You know, not all uh, of our organisms are able to capitalize on these urban and suburban resources, um, herps included. But but there's quite a few that can make do with with features all around our neighborhoods. Um, and like I said, those are the ones we're going to talk more about today. And so then, you know, when I ask you this question again, is this wildlife habitat? Hopefully, people. Uh, now begin to realize that that even though it's not what we necessarily might have thought of first, it, it actually can be a, a good example of, of wildlife habitat for some species, whether we like it or not. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to a breakdown of our different snakes that we have across the state of Virginia. So there's 32 species of snakes in Virginia. Eight of them are smaller bodied snakes. So these are going to be snakes that are under about 18 inches or, or one and a half feet as adults. We've got 11 of them that are medium sized snakes. So these guys are averaging between 18 inches and about three feet. And then about 13 of them, which are made up of larger bodied snakes. So these are gonna be anywhere from three feet and up. The longest species of snake in Virginia and actually in the United States is gonna be the black rat snake. This is one that folks see a lot. Um, our record for rat snakes in Virginia, the, the longest one we found is 6.65 feet. Um, but larger records actually exist across the United States. I, I'm pretty sure there's a record that's right at seven feet, if not over it. All right, so one more poll question. How many venomous species of snakes do we have in the state of Virginia? What do we think? How many venomous species in the state of Virginia? Sixteen of thirty-one, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one of thirty-one, twenty-five of thirty-one. There's a twenty-six, twenty-seven. All right, I'll end the poll here and I'll share the results with you guys. All right, so here's what people said. Most people thought three snakes is what it looks like, 15, um, but it looks like there's anywhere from one to six. Luckily, nobody thinks more than six and no one thinks zero. Those are definitely wrong answers. Um, so let's stop sharing those. What is the answer? It's three. I'm so, you guys know more about snakes than most people do. <laughs> Normally when I ask these questions to people, they don't, um, the majority is not getting the correct answers. So you guys should all be very proud of yourselves. But yes, we have three venomous snakes in the state of Virginia. We have copperheads, which you can see right here. We have cotton mouths, which you see right here. And this one here is a, uh, a timber or a cane break rattlesnake. Those are actually the same species, albeit different subspecies, but, but same species, Protolus horridus. Um, timbers are in the mountains, cane breaks are, are on the, the east coast, but like I said, same species, so that's why it's only counted once. Okay, so let's uh, dial in our, our focus a little bit more and think about the venomous snakes in James City County or in Williamsburg. So think about how many of those three species you think actually occur in James City County slash Williamsburg. The poll should be launching. There we go. And I will give you guys a hint. It is not four, five, or six. <laughs> 25 of 31 answers, 26. There's 27 of 31. 
Okay, 27 has seemed to be the magic. Oh, there's 28. Okay, we'll end it here. All right, so most people said two. Um, there are two venomous species of James City or venomous species in James City County or Williamsburg. Eight people said one, four people said three. Okay, so what is the answer? Oops. The answer is one, it is just copperheads. Um, a lot of people think that we have cotton mouths in James City County or Williamsburg. And there has actually never been a verified record of a cotton mouth in James City County or Williamsburg. And just to demonstrate that, um, here is our range map for cotton mouths in Virginia. And you can see, you know, why a lot of people think that here in James City County and Williamsburg, we're, we're pretty close to where there are documented copperhead occurrences in, in Newport News and, and in York County. But let me tell you, there's a lot of people who have tried to find a cotton mouth in, in Williamsburg and James City County, and it has not happened. So I, I don't think they're here. Um, that's the, the professional opinion. But if anybody um, wants to send me a photo and GPS coordinates uh, that they think they found one in, in the county, um, I'd be happy to look at it and let you know. And the other one is, um, once again, that timber cane break rattlesnake. So here's the timber coloration. This is timber range here in the mountains. Cane breaks are, are limited to a similar set of counties, albeit a, a few less than the cottonmouths did. But once again, no records from James City County or Williamsburg. So it's really just copperheads that we have here. Okay, so going back to our Snakes of Virginia screen, um, you know, there's a lot of really, really cool species that are, are up on this slide, but the ones that I really want to focus on are, are this select remaining group of what I call the really small snakes, the ones that are under 18 inches. So these are really small snakes. They're super secretive in nature. Honestly, there's really not a lot that's known about them. Um, you know, a lot of the information we know about other snakes, you know, things like home range sizes and spatial ecology and even dietary ecology to some extent, we just don't know a lot about these species. Um, despite them actually being, you know, in, in high abundance in some local areas and neighborhoods and, and everything like that. Um, they're just not a very attractive species, I think, for a lot of herpetologists to study, you know, I hate to say it, but a lot of herpetologists, they like to focus on the really big snakes. You know, they all want to be Steve Irwin, but there's a lot of really, really cool little snakes that we can find in our backyard. So I'm a big fan of these guys, and I love to talk about them whenever I have the opportunity to. So one of the most common ones that we have around James City County and that you guys are very, very likely to encounter in neighborhoods, in gardens, all of that sort of stuff um, are Decay's brown snakes. Now this is one that everyone thinks that these guys are baby copperheads. Um, that is always what happens. Um, you know, I, I see tons of, of photos of these on the Nextdoor app, on Facebook in the spring, in the fall. Everybody thinks it's a baby copperhead when actually what they're finding, you know, a snake about this long is actually a full-sized adult decays brown snake. Um, and honestly, they are probably the most common one that you're going to find in a garden or in a neighborhood. I bet that the vast majority of people on this call have actually found them um, before. So with this particular species, this is an example of one of the ones that give live birth. The females are actually going to be slightly larger than males, um, both in terms of length and in terms of, of girth. Uh, and their diet primarily consists of earthworms, snails, and slugs. And you guys are going to see that's going to be a repeated pattern for these small garden snakes. A, a lot of them like to eat these really soft-bodied arthropods. And so here's just some other pictures. Um, they, like many herps, you know, they vary in coloration and pattern a lot. So this one is a lot more gray, a little bit more checkerboarded. And, and just take note of how it's flattening its head here um, to give off that appearance of the really triangular shaped head to make itself look like a venomous snake when it's actually not. Here's another one. And you can see they're really pretty snakes, right? Yeah. This is what the bottom of them looks like, the ventral surface, generally pale, unpatterned, maybe, or maybe with a little bit of speckling. And that's about the, the full size relative to a dime. So you guys can see just how small they are. So the next species that we might find in our gardens around Williamsburg is going to be the red-bellied snake. This is a cousin of our decays brown snake. They have the same genus, Steraria. This one, the red-bellied snake, Steraria sipida maculata. Um, 
they're a little bit less prolific than the brown snakes, less common in, in our urban areas. Um, once again, the females are going to be larger than males and, and they're going to give live birth. But, but like I said, they, they're just not as common in our like neighborhood environments. They seem to like really wooded areas uh, that are adjacent to wetlands and primarily. That, that's a lot of times where you can find them. Um, these guys are really cool though because they're gastropod specialists, so uh, slug and snail specialists. And they actually have this specialized suite of teeth that they can use when they grab a slug and they can use this tooth to kind of circle around the slug um, and ex or the snail and extract it from the shell just like you would, you know, like a can opener. That, that They basically have a tooth that's a can opener for a snail. Um, so they're a really, really cool snake. And you can see this is another small body snake. This is an adult here that this person is holding. And this is a close-up picture of them. Once again, really, really pretty snakes. Um, they're typically not as patterned as your decays are on the top. And then of course, they've got that bright red underside. Here's a, a full body picture of an adult. Okay, um, another one, the ring neck snake. This one looks pretty similar to that last one we just saw, the red bellied snake, because once again, they've got that brightly colored ventral surface. Um, but this is a totally different genus and species, Diadophus punctatus. And I actually really love the genus Diadophus because uh, it's that, that term is derived from the Greek word um, diadem, which means headband. And that's because they've got this little headband on their neck. And then ophis, which means snake. So that's how they got their genus. Um, and these guys are similar to the red-bellied snakes in the sense that they, they seem to have a preference for these really dry areas. Um, they do like moist areas in dry habitats though. So they really like to be sheltered under things, you know, rocks, logs, wetter areas, wetter microhabitat and in, in overall large dry habitat, if that makes sense. And we've actually got two subspecies. We've got Northern and Southern ringneck snakes here in James City County. With this one, these guys lay eggs. Um, the males are gonna actually be slightly larger than the females, unlike the other two. And they have a really similar diet, once again, um, although they, they do often incorporate salamanders if, if they can get them into their diet. So here's another one. Um, they can be a little bit variable in terms of the patterning on the, the belly there, as you can see. They have this really flat head, which allows them to really get underneath of logs and rocks. Um, and just so you guys can get a feel for how small their eggs are, uh, these are, these are ringneck snake eggs here. Um, in comparison to this penny. So you can see how, how absolutely tiny they are, these little tic-tac shaped eggs. I think most people would see these and think that they belong to an insect or something. Our other one that we can find a lot of times in the garden is the Eastern worm snake, Carphophus aminus. Um, this is another personal favorite of mine. Now these guys are really, really fossorial. So what that means is that they spend actually most of their time underground. You will almost never just encounter one of these across the surface, right? They, they spend all their time underground burrowing. Um, and this is a great photo kind of depicting that. You can see this sand on top of this one's head. They like this really loose, sandy soil, which is why so many people find these in their gardens. You know, we already have really loose, sandy soil in our garden. So they're very, very commonly encountered when you're working in the garden in the spring and fall. Um, they're fabulous burrowers. They give live birth. Females are larger than males. Um, they get their name worm snake because not only do they look like worms, but they also eat primarily worms. And these guys are pretty easy to identify because their their head, you know, it's so, so pointed. Uh, that's what really allows them to dig through soil and sand. And I feel like they also have this really two colored kind of like half an e like Easter egg, you know, when you dye half of an Easter egg one color and then you do the other side. Um, that That's really how the coloration is with worm snakes. So if you see that really clear half and half and it's a small garden snake, it's probably gonna be a worm snake. And they're just once again, really cool looking snakes. Um, now, and the, the last two that I'll show you that are, are garden species that we can find in Virginia, there's actually two species that I'm incorporating on this slide. They are rough earth snakes and smooth earth snakes. Um, they used to both be housed under the same Virginia genus, but then in 2013, there were, uh, there was a genetic analysis that was published that actually sunk that and they moved the rough earth snakes to their own genus, even though the two species look very, very similar um, and have very similar life histories. The, the way you really tell them apart is by looking at the scales. So 
Um, this here is a rough earth snake and it's got these keels in each of the scales here, this ridge in the middle of the snail or scale. Um, so that's how you would tell a rough earth snake from a smooth earth snake like this one. You can see there's no more, this one is smooth, no keels, no bumpy ridges on the scales relative to this one here. So hopefully that demonstrates to people. Um, now for the smooth earth snakes, I'm a big fan of these guys. Um, they actually got their name from uh, Valeria Biddle Blaney. I love her name. It sounds like it's straight out of like Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings. Um, and uh, she lived from 1828 to 1900, and she was actually the first person to discover this species uh, in Kent County, Maryland. So um, there's not too many snakes that are named after women, but this is one of the few of them. There's a lot of question with these guys as to whether or not they're more terrestrial, um, like the, the brown snakes and the ringneck snakes, or if they're more fossorial, like those worm snakes that I said spend most of the time underground. This, this just kind of gets back to that thing of, about where we as scientists just don't have a lot of information on these guys. Um, but they do give live birth, the females are larger than males, and, and once again, a, a diet primarily of earthworms. So this one here is a rough snake or a rough earth snake. Hopefully you can see the keels. We've got a smooth earth snake. And then they're, they're small. This is an adult in this person's hands. Um, and not to belabor the point about Valeria Biddle Blaney, <laughs> but I have tried so hard to find a picture of her um, just because I would love to be able to include that in these presentations like this. But I, there's not a photo of her that exists. I've even gone to the Smithsonian archives and I have not been able to dig up a photo of her, but she does have some, um, some very famous relatives. Her husband was a very famous union general in the civil war. And really of note, her cousin was Spencer Fullerton Baird, which I don't know how many naturalist nerds we have on this presentation right now, but um, he was the very first curator of the Smithsonian Institute. He was a very, very famous naturalist. He increased the Smithsonian's record of specimens from 6,000 when he started to 2 million by the time he died. So that was her cousin. Um, she obviously spent a lot of time with him. Um, and, and that was how she got that, that snake named after her. <laughs> All right, so here's one, another poll for you guys. So of those species that I just showed you, how many of them do you think you found while gardening or working in the yard? And this one should be a multiple answer one. So you can select all of the, you could select multiple answers if you found, if you think you found multiples of these species. I see five of 32 people are seem to be answering this one a little bit uh, less frequently. <laughs> Maybe people aren't sure. 17 of 32, 19 of 32, 21 of 32. I guess I should have had a question for none. I didn't think to put that in there. <laughs> Okay, it's slowed down at 2432. So I'll end it here. So here's what people think. It seems like the most commonly found one around Williamsburg is that worm snake, which makes sense. Um, yeah, they're, like I said, really, really commonly found in, in gardens. And then the second is that decays brown snake. Um, not too many people have found red-bellied snakes, which, yeah, I just, they're, they're just not as commonly found as the others. You can still do it, but not as often. Um, so yeah. Now maybe uh, in the future, you'll know more about the snakes you find while you're gardening in, in your yards. Okay, so just a handful of other urban snakes that we commonly find, but they're not these small bodied secretive ones. This one I'm sure most people are gonna recognize. It is the, um, the black rat snake. Uh, so they have a couple of different cool things about them. This is actually the juveniles, what they look like when they hatch out of the eggs. They don't look anything really like the adults that have that all black coloration we associate them with. So a lot of people will find these juveniles and they won't realize that it's a rat snake. Um, here's an adult here. And they have these two pretty cool things that they do when they're feeling threatened. One of them is that they crinkle their body up like this. You can see this really zigzag behavior. We don't see that in, in other snakes in North America. And, and we don't know exactly why it is that rat snakes do that, but the hypothesis is that it's uh, to break up the, the line of their body and help them blend into the surroundings a little bit better. So they're not just this straight black line in the, in the habitat. 
And then the other thing that they do when they feel threatened is that they'll they'll really kind of raise themselves up like this and they really flatten their heads. You can see this one here, how triangular he's tried to make his head um, to make himself look like a, a venomous snake. And there's also this kind of old adage that if you see a snake and you think, how the heck did it get there? You're probably looking at a rat snake. And that's because they're just such good climbers. I mean, these guys will, they, they get everywhere. If, if you find a snake in your house, it's almost always going to be a rat snake because they're just, they're such acrobats. Um, they're fabulous, fabulous climbers. And they spend most of their time up in the trees. So another really common urban one are uh, water snakes. There's uh, northern water snakes and brown water snakes that occur in James City County. I won't get down into the details of um, identifying one from the other, but these guys are really, really commonly confused with cottonmouths, which remember there's no cottonmouths in James City County. Um, but yeah, so these are the ones that a lot of times you see basking on logs near water. Um, they're primarily fish and frog eaters. So if, if you see a snake near the water or like a retention pond, it's very likely a, a water snake. And then of course, one of the other really common ones that we get here are copperheads, which are venomous. Um, so this here is an adult copperhead and you can see a juvenile. They've got this, uh, this bright yellow tail. This is something that the, the hatchling or not hatchlings because they give live birth, um, what the, the juvenile copperheads have after they're born and that they slowly lose that with age. Um, so I want to get into just a, a handful of things about identifying copperheads. Um, you can see here, these two look really, really similar. This is a, a northern water snake, like we just talked about, and this is a copperhead. And in terms of coloration and, and even pattern to some degree, they're very, very similar. Um, at the end of the day, though, you know, it's not a good idea to be identifying snakes uh, by coloration or pattern. Unlike some other organisms like butterflies, which are, are pretty um, similar in terms of their appearance, when it comes to snakes, they are so, so variable, individual to individual. I mean, these water snakes, for example, they can be anywhere from gray to orange to brown to black to red. They're all over the board. And even copperheads have a lot of variation in color as well. Um, so you don't want to be looking at that too much. But um, just a couple of things to point out, you know, water snakes, they have these really, really clear uh, bands. These are called labial bars on their, their scales, whereas copperheads have this really, really clean face. And um, the dark part of the pattern of copperheads is typically wider on the bottom, and it's skinny at the top, and it's the inverse on the water snakes. You can see the dark part of the pattern is skinny on the bottom and wide at the top. Um, but at the end of the day, you really need to be looking at multiple features to identify snakes. And if you can't really um, really feel confident in your identification, it's, it's best to just kind of let the snake be. Um, here's just another picture of another water snake and another copperhead that, that shows kind of that same thing. And here you can see the water snakes once again flattening its head. Still has these labial bars though, um, and the banding is, is relatively the same. But for the water snake, it's wide at the top, whereas for the copperhead, it's skinny at the top. Um, another thing that we hear all the time is that uh, you should use the pupil shape to identify a venomous snake. Number one, you should never be getting close enough to a venomous snake to really be discerning what its pupils look like. That's, I, I think, just common sense. Um, but the other thing that's really problematic here is that just like people, uh, snake pupils will dilate based on, or dilate based on light levels. So this one here has pretty circular pupils. And, and just to really drive that point home, I've got this progression. You can watch how wide the pupils get in these different photos. So this is a really skinny slit, a little wider, a little wider, even wider to just about a full on circle. So that adage about the pupil shape, that's really not a good one to go off of either. Um, so what to do if you see a snake and you can't identify it? No one has ever been bitten by a snake <laughs> by recognizing there is a snake in front of them and then just taking two or three steps back. <laughs> you know, no one is ever gonna get bit by a snake once you recognize its presence and then you just remove yourself from the snake. Um, the people who are most commonly or most co likely to get bit by a snake are the ones who are trying to harass the snake. They're trying to pick it up. They're trying to kill it. You know, by that very nature, you're putting yourself in proximity to get bit. So you don't know what the snake is, just leave it alone. Um, or use this as an opportunity to learn and grow <laughs> and step back, take a picture, and then attempt to identify it later. You know, look at photos online, send it to an expert. 
um, and, and just continue to build up your knowledge of, of snakes. And, and finally, as a last resort, one thing you can always do is spray it with a garden hose. You can do this from a safe distance. You don't have to put yourself right near the snake. Um, you just use that jet stream function on a, a garden hose nozzle. And I guarantee they'll go the opposite direction uh, that, that you're spraying them from because they really don't like that. Okay, so just a few of our other uh, garden guests, box turtles. These are ones that people find really, really, really commonly. This is a terrestrial turtle. They do not go in ponds. I mean, they will to get a drink, but they're not like other turtles that spend most of their time in the water. So unfortunately there's a handful of people that will find box turtles and then they think they belong in the water and they throw them in a pond and, and that's not good. <laughs> These guys spend most of their, their life terrestrially. Um, so here's an adult right here. And here's a juvenile. You can see the juveniles look pretty different from the adults, but one really clear indicator uh, of a, that this is a juvenile box turtle is the, this ridge right here down the middle of their scoots. Each one of these little segments is called a scoot. So here's a scoot, here's a scoot. But yeah, they've got this ridge down the, the midline of their carapace, which is the top of the turtle shell. More pictures of box turtles. Um, there's this saying that if it, the box turtle has red eyes, it's a male. If it has brown eyes, it's a female. For the most part, that holds up. Um, but there have, I've definitely found females with red eyes and males vice versa. But for the most part, like I said, the, the vast majority of them, that, that will hold up. Another way you can identify the sex of a box turtle is by looking at the plastron, which is the bottom of the turtle shell. The males will have this indentation or this, this concave um, in the plastron, whereas the females will just have this straight flat shell. Um, and you can see that the box turtles, they also have this front hinge, which really allows them to shut themselves into their shell completely. Another garden guest that we get a lot of times are snapping turtles. Now these guys get a bad rap, um, just like snakes do, but I have to tell you, I am absolutely fascinated by snapping turtles. I mean, they are so cool looking. They, I, in my mind, this is the closest thing we are ever going to get to seeing a living dinosaur um, because they're just so, so prehistoric looking. And they're really, really great at traversing the landscape. I mean, you can see this one, they, they can lift themselves up and they will walk and they move these great distances, especially around the breeding season. Um, so they're just really, really cool turtles. Um, and in fact, they are so good at moving that they are, it, it's very easy for them to even climb chain link fences, like what you see here. Um, this, this happens all the time. They climb these fences and then they just throw themselves off the other side and they keep going. So they're just really cool turtles. Um, another thing that I like about them is the shape of their plastron, which is once again, that bottom shell. So you can learn a lot about turtles by the, the shape of the plastron. So Snapping turtles have a really, really small plastron, right? It's this really small diamond shaped plastron. And what this does is it really lets them move their arms around because they, they spend so much time in the mud and you need a lot of muscle to drag yourself through the mud, right? So they, they spend all this time um, walking through the mud. So that uh, is much easier when you have a small plastron like this, as opposed to a plastron like this painted turtle over here which um, spends most of its time in the water column. So it needs to be really, um, really uh, able to, to glide through the water pretty easily and not encounter a lot of resistance. So they have this really, really flat plastron and flat carapace. Um, and if you were a snapping turtle and you had a, a plastron like this, it, you would just not be able to get the full movement with your arms. Um, so yeah, turtles, you, you can learn so much about their life history by just considering the plastrons. Um, and another great example is the box turtle. You know, I, I mentioned the hinges that they have that allows them to completely close themselves up like this. Uh, whereas this one, this is when it's open, you know, being on the ground, not in the water, they encounter a lot of raccoon predators that raccoons, you know, they have their, their thumbs and they're very, very good at digging into things. So this hinged uh, plastron really lets them lock themselves so that a raccoon couldn't uh, get their little fingers in to predate them and, um, and, and have a snack. Back to snapping turtles though. Um, we will find these guys often in, in gardens. And if that happens, just treat them like a snake, leave them alone. You can spray them with a garden hose and typically they'll just, they'll move on. Um, it, it's, it's generally wise not to get in their way. Um, another thing about snapping turtles is if you do attempt to pick one up, you never wanna hold them by their tail. 
um, that can actually really, really, it can break their, their spinal cords. The, the tail, it, it's full of vertebra that are, are connected um, all through the body, just like ours. And so you can dislocate vertebra and you can, you can mortally wound them by holding them by just the, the, the weight of the tail. So the best way to hold them, if you do, um, I don't recommend that you do, but if, if you do, is to just get your hands uh, in the in between right here. You want to basically just hold them by the shell right here. And so this is an adult snapping turtle digging a nest in someone's garden. And this one here is a juvenile. Um, but you can see both of them have this very long tail. That's a great way to identify juvenile snapping turtles is by the presence of this really, really long tail. Um, this is how we, we often find snapping turtles crossing the road, or, or once again, we find them as a, a little turtle. This one's covered in mud because it dug itself out of a garden nest. If you encounter one across the road and you want to get it across, a great tip is to take the floor mats from your car and you can just get behind the snapping turtle and you can just kind of usher it along with your floor mats. And then you can get them to move a little bit faster. You saw how mobile they are um, without actually needing to pick it up. So. Just keep that in mind for the next time you find a snapping turtle crossing the road. Um, another one we get a lot are sliders. There's several different species. I, I won't go into the breakdown, but it's generally the females will find them crossing yards, especially after the rain. They like soft, wet soil to dig nests in the spring and summer. Um, so you may find these guys walking across the yard looking for a nest or a place to nest. Um, they're very, very sensitive to disturbance. So if they're disturbed while they're in the process of looking for a, a nice sunny spot to lay their eggs, um, they, they'll typically abandon it and they'll leave even midway through laying. So I always tell people, you know, if you see this, really try to observe from a distance, don't get up close to them because you can, um, if they're disturbed enough, they can actually reabsorb those, those developing eggs inside of them um, and, and not even lay any eggs that year. So it's good to just let them be. Um, but then, you know, in the, in the fall, in the late summer, you get these, um, if they do nest in your yard, you get these little hatchling sliders um, that, that start crawling out of the ground. <laughs> now, unfortunately, um, raccoon predators are like the number one thing that, that will impact a turtle nest's failure. So these here are signs of turtle nests that have been raided by raccoons. It's dug up and you've got eggshells laid everywhere. So if you do have a turtle that lays a nest in your yard and you want to make sure raccoons can't get into the nest, a great way to protect it is by um, basically just putting up some sort of caged barrier like this. Now you don't want to put this up and then leave it. You want to make sure that there's like openings for the, the hatchling turtles to come out or that um, they, can, uh, they can fit through this wire mesh here. Um, you know, another thing too that I, I often tell people, one of the, the big things that attracts the raccoons to the turtle nest is that um, when they are getting ready to dig out a nest, they will actually urinate. Um, that's what makes the ground a little bit softer and easier to dig through with their back legs. Um, and it's the, it's the scent of the turtle urine, I think that, that really brings the raccoons in. So you can always cage a nest right after it's laid. And then if you don't wanna worry about trapping the hatchlings, just pull the barrier after you know a month. And, and then the, the scent has worn off and so they're not really likely to get predated then. Okay, and so, um, you know, this is the other thing that happens with turtles all the time. Um, you know, people, people find a turtle and then they get into this crux of what they do. They find a turtle crossing the road. It seems like a bad area. It's a busy street. So um, when it comes to turtles, just think about them like people. If you see someone who's crossing the road who needs help, do you either A, help them get to the other side and stop traffic if necessary, or B, do you put them in your car and drive them to the other side of town because you think that's a better spot for them? Hopefully most of you are gonna say A. Um, it doesn't matter how much, uh, how nice your pond is, when it comes to turtles, it's really best to let them be, even if it's a really, really busy street. I mean, turtles especially, they, they spend their whole lives in the same area and they, they make the same movements to the same places every year. They hibernate in the same places. They go to the same places to mate. And once you pick them up and move them, it would be like somebody picking you up and, and just dropping you in the middle of nowhere in Florida. Um, so unfortunately, when they're, they're, when they're relocated like that, most of them do die. So it's always better to just let them be, help them across the road if possible, um, and then part ways. <laughs> okay, a few other garden guests that we can find. 
Um, we've got spring peepers. That's this one. Hope, I'm sure lots of people have been hearing spring peepers. I know I have. We've got green tree frogs, gray tree frogs. This is actually a, a recently metamorphosed gray tree frog. They, when they come out or when they metamorphose, they have this green color, like a green tree frog, but then as they age, they develop their chalky gray that they're known for. This one here is a pickerel frog. You're, you're likely not gonna have them unless you've got uh, like a retention pond or water bodies nearby. And of course, toads. We actually have three different species of toads in James City County. You've got Americans, Fowlers, and Southerns. Um, so if anybody wants more resources on how to identify them, I'm just asking the chat and I'm happy to point you in directions. But frogs are, are one that we, we can definitely find in our gardens. And the thing important that's really important to note about frogs is that they have really, really sensitive skin. Um, they actually do a decent amount of oxygen exchange through their skin. Um, and so when you find a frog, as tempting as it may be, it's really important not to touch them just because their skin is so, so sensitive. Um, even the oils on our skin can, can really, really cause some serious issues with frogs. So it's always better to just let them be as cute as they are. Um, and when it comes to toads, th there's that old adage that if a toad pees on you, it, it, it can cause warts. That's not true. Um, their, their skin is a little bit tougher. Um, it's more keratinized, um, but, but no, they won't, they won't cause warts from handling them. All right, so at the end of the day, why should you care about all of these different species that I'm talking to you about? Um, the reality of the situation is that globally, herps, be it frogs or snakes or turtles, all of these populations are, are in decline. I mean, they are the most in declined organisms in the world right now, without a doubt. Um, but they actually contribute a ton to our ecosystems. And, and there's even benefits that, that they can offer or services that they can provide to people. Timber rattlesnakes, which we have here in Virginia, they, um, they really cut down on Lyme disease. You can see here, each snake removes 2,500 to 4,500 ticks annually, um, ticks that can cause Lyme disease. Garter snakes, they are great for gardens, just like so many of the other species that we mentioned that love to eat those slugs. They love to eat those snails, the garden pests. Um, copperheads, their venom is actually being used for, it's really, really promising for, for breast cancer research. As well as a variety of other snakes, their, their venom has roles um, in the medical fields. Pygmy rattlesnakes, they're working on a, a drug with their venom that helps stop heart attacks. And um, even snakes in other countries, Malayan pit vipers, for example, uh, they're using their venom to develop clot busting drugs. So th there's a lot, of, a lot of, you know, good things that can come out of having these organisms around. But at the end of the day, even if they didn't contribute anything to us, they're still just a natural part of the ecosystem and, and the environment. And we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't be so cavalier about them just disappearing across the landscape. So it's important to do things to support them. Um, so you could do something like install a tree frog condo. This is as simple as PVC pipes that are just a bungee cord to a tree. The, the tree frogs love these, gray tree frogs, green tree frogs. Um, you can tie them to a tree just like that one there. Just make sure you drill holes so they don't get full of water. Or you can just stick them right in the ground. Um, little kids love these too. So if you guys have grandkids, I'm sure they will love the tree frog condos. You can even make them more attractive like this one here. Somebody has more artistic talent than I do. Um, or you can really, really make them attractive and, and do something like this where you have got multiple little uh, tree frog pipes that are installed in your garden. These are, these are great. And like I said, the tree frogs absolutely love them. Um, you can always peek in during the day and, and see the tree frogs inside of them that have taken shelter. Toad abodes, this is another great one to make with kids. Uh-oh, my screen just, um, sorry guys, I think my PowerPoint just crashed on us. Take your time, we'll be patient. I know, I don't know what just happened. It just shut off on me. Let's pull it back up. It was almost done too. Okay, here we go. Sorry about that. Technical difficulties. 
Okay, so tota boats. This is another great way to provide shelter for amphibians in the garden. Um, they can be super basic like flower points or flower pots that are turned upside down, um, or they can be a little bit more decorative like these ones here. Um, I have several of these in my yard. And once the once things start opening up, um, I and more people get vaccinated, I plan on hosting a bunch of uh, workshops where folks can come and make their own tota boats or they can make their own frog condos. So um, when, when I get ready to schedule those, I'll be sure that everybody uh, gets a, gets an email invite about those workshops. But this is just another great way to create some really fun, nice little habitat features for these animals in, in your gardens. Uh, another thing that's super important is, is leaving the leaves every fall. Um, I, I know a lot of people don't like this. They like the really polished looking landscapes, but these leaves uh, that, that drop in the fall, they are so, so important, not just to soil composition and, and protecting plants, but um, there's a lot of caterpillars that will overwinter in leaves. Um, the, the bumblebee queens, they will often burrow down in the soil and the leaves really provide a nice layer of insulation. Luna moths, I absolutely love luna moths. They will, um, their cocoons will overwinter in leaves. Um, but so do many species are all those little garden snakes I talked to you about, um, as well as turtles. The leaves are, are such an important insulating layer for so many species. So that's another great way to support them in your gardens is, is make sure that you leave the leaves, uh, at least in your flower beds, um, if not your yard. <laughs> No pesticides. This is another really, really important one. We talked about, um, you know, the frogs and the sensitive skin. Pesticides are one that, that will definitely um, not only kill native pollinators, but they also will kill quite a few uh, amphibians as well as other reptiles. Um, so many of these species eat insects and the pesticides build up uh, in the, the insects or they eat insects that, that were sprayed with a pesticide um, and you get this buildup of pesticides. Most of them are also endocrine disruptors so they can cause infertility and they're generally just, they, there's so much runoff in the water. Um, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir with this group but all of that is just to say that pesticides in general, if you can go pesticide free, the, the wildlife will certainly appreciate it as well as your pollinators. Um, and frog ponds, this is a great addition. Everything needs water. Um, so if you can set yourself up a really, really attractive frog pond in the garden, this is such a great way to, um, to, to encourage more of them to, to come around. You know, you, can, you just wanna make sure that you, you mimic the natural environment as best you can. So like sloped edges, lots of rocks that they could use to get in and out native plants, that's so important. Definitely no fish. Fish like to eat frog eggs and tadpoles. Um, but you can create these really, really attractive uh, frog ponds that not only frogs, but, but many other species will benefit from. And um, if you do something like this, you might be fortunate enough to, to get some frog eggs, like these uh, gray tree frog eggs here, which once again, something that, that kids really love is to be able to watch eggs develop and turn into tadpoles and then metamorphosis. It's, it's a great, great learning experience for kids um, and it really benefits these guys. All right, so our very last poll of the presentation. <laughs> Did you guys learn anything from my poll today? What do you think? Was it really informative or do I really need to try harder next time to stump you with new information? <laughs> It looks like I did a good job. Um, here's our results. 100% said that they learned something new. So that makes me so, so happy, you guys. I'm so glad to hear that. Um, I, I Like I said, I, I think it's probably pretty obvious. I love reptiles and amphibians. So if anybody ever has a question about them, I will put my email in the chat box. Um, so you can always email me and ask me questions, get me to identify photos, and hopefully you'll continue to learn new things. <laughs> um, and I'll, with that, I'll take questions. And I've got some additional resources here if folks wanna learn more, be it about conservation or identification. Um, there's lots of great websites and groups that, that you can look at to learn more. So, Megan, everything. <laughs> this was fabulous. Oh, thank Just, you. <laughs> I mean, so, so informative. Um, I'll tell you what blew me away was the photograph of the turtle climbing the fence. <laughs> 
but uh, this is awesome. And for everyone who is, is on the call, we will definitely include all of the links and to, uh, to the various resources in the follow-up email. Uh, but this has been great. We have some questions in the chat box. <clears throat> um, here we go. There's one that's water moccasin and then mm -hmm. cotton mouth. The, the same two na names for the same snake, right? Yes, yes. So they are both Agkiscardon pisivorous, which is the, the scientific species name, but they both both of those common names refer to that same species, water moccasin and cottonmouth. You can use them interchangeably. They are not two different species. Okay, yeah. I didn't know that. Um, Janet asked, what's the difference between a turtle and a tortoise? Oh, that's a good question. Um, and I, I hate to say it, but it really gets down to genetic lineages um, and, and what lines they evolved from um, because, you know, I, I know this one gets confusing because we have those terrestrial box turtles, which really technically are turtles. That's that's the lineage the lineage they came from. Um, but there's some other things that you can notice about box turtles versus tortoises. Um, if you look at their feet, for example, tortoises have really flat club shaped feet uh, like elephants do, whereas uh, box turtles. If, if you hold a box turtle, you'll see that their feet are actually much more similar to the pond turtles and the sliders. They just kind of like elevate and almost like walk on tiptoes across the landscape, but it's not those, those flat club like feet. Um, so that's why we have the, our, ours are box turtles. Now there are two native tortoises in the US. One of them is in Florida and the other is on the Southwest. The one in Florida, they are called gopher tortoises. They're, they're super cool. And they're also in, um, in Georgia too. So, but no tortoises in Virginia, only box turtles. That's the closest we, we come. Do toads and frogs eat the same thing? Um, that's a good question. For the most part, they're both going to be eating um, really whatever they can fit in their mouths, insects, <laughs> small fish. Um, but the thing about this is you have to realize, you know, they spend most of their time in two different habitats. So that really prevents or limits competition. Frogs, um, frogs which which their skin is so much more sensitive to desiccation and drying out the 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 they're spending most of their time feeding near or in water whereas toads their skin is much more keratinized they don't need to be in the water all the time so they're able to capitalize on um quite a few additional resources that are not in in the water hopefully that makes sense <laughs> yeah it clears up clears a lot of stuff up for me the thank you uh -huh. um love the little frog condos mm -hmm. and toad condos. So question here, what diameter PVC pipe do you recommend for the tree frogs? Um, that's a good question. For the most part, um, I would say an inch and a half to two or three inches. You don't want to do too small, but but an inch and a half to two or three inches um, will will be just fine for them. Loved, I loved the examples that you showed of the, the potted arrangements. I don't know, I'm gonna, I want to make one of those. And when you do do your little workshops, send me the information. We will mm -hmm. put that out and share it uh, to our, uh, our email list. Uh, Terry said, great presentation. Um, if you mow fallen leaves to break them down, will the leaf mulch still be helpful to wildlife? Yeah, so um, obviously mowing them to break them down, you, you will definitely get a better soil composition. Um, for species like, uh, you know, the, the small snakes and whatnot that will hibernate or overwinter under the leaves, um, at the time people are typically mowing, so like fall or early spring, those species aren't full on hibernating. Like they would be in the middle of winter or December where they're, they're not really easy to, to rouse then. Um, but in the fall or the spring, they're a little bit more sensitive to disturbance. So typically things like mowers, like the noise and the vibrations will, um, will send them away temporarily and then they would come back. Um, but there are other things, you know, like, like some of those cocoons and pollinators and whatnot that they mm -hmm. they can't um they can't necessarily leave 
in general, leaf mulch, what, what I will say in general, leaf mulch is better than just full on removing the leaves and scooping everything up though. Mm -hmm. Another compliment, outstanding. Thank you, thank you. This was terrific, thank you. Question, what are the types of plants that frogs love? Bullfrogs, oh gosh, that's... <laughs> but, and, so, and he says bullfrogs specifically to eat or hide in. Um, I wouldn't say that there's any specific type of plant that um, bullfrogs love as opposed to any of our other large water frogs like uh, leopard frogs or pickerel frogs. Um, really what they like is just lots of native vegetation for them to hide in. Um, you know, pickerel weed, smart weed, uh, the lily pads are great. They, they, they really like highly vegetated plants. So I would say it's more about a density, a high density of native species, as opposed to um, a low density of, of species where you don't have that many habitat places. But, but those are some examples, pickerel weed, um, cattails, you know, any of that stuff that, that provides more structure. Okay. Um, somebody loves tree frogs, but says, I have a lot of snakes. Will that limit my tree frog population? So that's a good question. It really depends on the snakes. Um, but for the most part, it, it wouldn't. I mean, the tree frogs are spending so much time in the canopies of the trees and there's not too many snakes that go all the way up in the canopies. Now the rat snakes do, but they really eat primarily bird eggs and raid bird nests, which I don't, I hate to say because I know that makes people not like the rat snakes, but the rat snakes, they're not as interested in tree frogs as they are um, the bird nests. Whereas most of the other species, um, if a tree frog is on the ground, like a racer might go after it, but um, that you you wouldn't have too much snakes eating tree frogs. <laughs> and you speak to lizards or salamanders we might find in the garden. Yeah, so um, salamanders, I'm not as good with my salamanders, I'll be honest, guys. I mean, I, I, I know them, but I just don't know exactly what species are in James City County. Some of the really common ones though that I'm sure we have are like uh, the spotted salamanders, two line salamanders, red back salamanders. Um, there's several that, that you can find in the garden, um, quite a few. What I would recommend doing is visiting the Herpetological Society, their website. They actually have a, um, a spot where you could put your county in and it will generate a list of every single species of turtle, frog, snake, salamander that's found in your county. So that's a really, really helpful resource. Um, but with salamanders, there's there's quite a few, and just like snakes, they are they're so diverse. I actually realized this morning that I didn't include any salamanders in this presentation. But honestly, we could do a whole another one hour presentation just on salamanders alone. <laughs> um, lizards, there's way fewer lizards than than other um, species. I, there's only a handful of them. Skinks are one that we do have in James City County. Um, quite a few that, that all look very similar. The only way to identify them is by really counting scales on the, the bellies and the faces, but there's five line skinks, um, both south, uh, southeastern um, and then broad headed skinks are, are another one. Um, so yeah, they, they all look really similar though. To most people, they're not going to be catching skinks and counting the scales on their face to figure out exactly what species. <laughs> up close, like I, yeah, um, getting up close and personal. Somebody <laughs> would like to know what can we do to help the skink population? Oh, I don't know if that means help the skinks, like support the skinks to be more prolific or help them like they have too many skinks and they want to see less skinks. I th I, I'm going to take it as what can we do to help protect skinks? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And if I'm if I'm wrong on that, go ahead and let me know. In the, uh, um, with protecting skinks, it's going to be really similar to these other things, you know. Um, definitely not using pesticides or anything like that because they eat primarily insects, and you don't want those um, those toxin loads to build up. Build up, but it's your same suite of basic needs. You know, they need water, they need structure, so lots of plants. Skinks especially love really, really sunny, bright, sunny, open places that are close by to sheltered, structured places. Um, so they can thermoregulate in the sun, but then they've got shelter if they need it. 
And one thing I actually really love about skinks and anoles is that the males are incredibly territorial. So the skinks that you see in your gardens, um, they have their own little territories and they'll keep other males out. Um, and you'll typically see the same ones year to year, um, but, but they will really, really defend their little territory. So you might have uh, skinks where one of them's territory is your deck and another skinks territory is the garden. They have this whole little web of little skink territories all across the house. I love it. A pecking order of skinks. Exactly. Um, do black rat do black rat snakes eat copperhead snakes? Mm, black rat snakes do not eat copperhead snakes. Um, now, once again, if you remember early on in that myth slide where we talked about the black snake. Um, that doesn't really exist because there's so many different species that everyone kind of lumps together. Um, there is a species that's black, the Eastern King snake, that they are known for eating snakes. And that's actually why they have their name, King snake. It's because they eat only other snakes, mm. including copperheads. Um, they they <clears throat> eat venomous snakes in their area. Um, and racers, black racers will do it too, but black rat snakes do not. Um, technically eat other snakes. That is fascinating. By the way, for all of all of you who come and visit the garden, we do have a resident, um, We, I, I think it's a black rat snake. Um, and it has startled a few people, including some of the pe people who have gone into the shed to get tools because it, it, it likes it there. Um, so, but you know, do not be alarmed. It is our resident snake. Um, all right, next question. Why do the tree frogs love my windows at night? Oh, that's a great question. The tree frogs love my windows at night also. Um, and if you think about it, this is because oftentimes at night, um, we will have uh, lights on in our houses and the lights attract insects. And then um, they just really realize that just like insects go to lights, um, that's a really, really good spot for them to get uh, some easy free meals. The other thing I will say is depending on the siding on your house, um, a lot of times tree frogs will spend the day tucked up under the siding of the house or um, behind like some, they'll wedge themselves, you know, uh, as not like getting inside the structure of your house, but they'll use the window trim, the exterior window trim to just um, to keep themselves wet during the day because they can't dry, they don't, they don't wanna be out during the day because they dry out. So they come out at night, they're nocturnal. Um, and a lot of times they'll use the structure around the windows and the doors um, to, to just stay tight and keep themselves wet and humid through the day. And then um, Jennifer wanted to know what's the link to get the species in our zip code and we'll include that. But yep, if you- I will pull that up um, right now for folks and I will post it into the chat. Okay, that'll be great. Along with my email address, because I know I didn't include that anywhere. And Roberta um, confirmed that I was correct how to protect the skinks. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell me something about the bright green snake that was featured in one of your slides as a snake found in Virginia? So I love that question because um, one of the, the species of snakes that I studied for my master's thesis was uh, that particular snake, rough green snakes. Um, we have two in Virginia that are, that are bright green and really similar. There's the rough green snake and the smooth green snake. So this is just like the, um, the earth snakes uh, where there's like a rough species and a smooth species. So both of those occur in Virginia. Um, and they're another one that spends a lot of time in the canopies. They eat re only insects. Uh, they especially like the spiders and the crickets. They're not going after the earthworms and the slugs like those fossorial on the ground species, but spiders and crickets they really like. And um, green snakes especially really like to be near wetland habitats. And there's, um, there's some documentation of them actually hanging down from tree branches and nabbing little minnows. Um, out of wetland habitats. But, but they are another one of those species that we just, they're, they're very understudied. Um, we don't know a lot about them. Being up in the canopies of the trees all the time, they're, they're hard for us to, to study. Um, but they are one of my absolute personal favorites and they're beautiful. Um, 
And one thing I want to say too, that I forgot to mention all these little garden snakes that, that I showed you guys today. Um, if you guys have grandkids, these are great, great snakes to be introducing to grandkids because their mouths are so, so small um, that their teeth, you know, number one, I've never been, I've been bitten by many snakes. <laughs> I've never been bitten by one of the species that I showed you guys today. Um, their, their whole MO is to hide their, their flight. They're not fight, put it that way. Um, I've held thousands of them, never been bitten by, by these particular little species. They are great to show to kids. Um, and even if one was to bite, their teeth are so small that it wouldn't, you wouldn't even know if you were bitten by one. But um, like I said, they're just, they're great introductory snakes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is true that most people have an irrational fear of snakes and uh, you have done a lot to dispel the myths. Um, and there is one, one more question here. Uh, were you bitten by a venomous snake? Fortunately, I have never been bitten by a venomous snake. Um, I have been bitten by many, many non-venomous snakes. I've worked with venomous snakes. I do trainings for law enforcement officers with how to safely handle venomous snakes. And I've worked with Eastern diamondback rattlesnakes, but I always take a ton of precautions. I wear um, like snake boots or snake chaps. I use hooks. I have tubes that I get the snakes to crawl up into so that they can't turn around. And I never bare hand a venomous snake ever. Um, if I am going to be touching or holding a venomous snake, it is a snake that is in a tube um, that has no way of turning around and coming back to bite me. So lots of precautions that I take. So fortunately, I have never been bitten by one, despite working with them pretty regularly. And hopefully I never will be as long as I continue to stay safe. <laughs> Any other questions before we wrap it up? My goodness, Megan, thank you so much for uh, just an outstanding presentation. Thank you. <laughs> really appreciate it. Well, it's quiet from Peanut Gallery. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for participating so um, eagerly and enthusiastically in our polls. That was pretty cool. So and more thank yous are coming in. I think we are going to call it a wrap. Have a great day, everyone. We'll be posting the recording within, hopefully soon. <laughs> I'm, I'm on guest Wi-Fi, um, but we'll send out the follow-up email with additional links for resources. Have a great day. See you soon. Bye-bye.